OK, welcome everyone to the second installment in this term's Evolutionary Medicine and Public Health Seminar series. I'm excited to introduce Dr. Sharon Kessler, who lectures with the Department of Psychology at the University of Stirling. will be giving us a talk today based on her recent paper with Bob Unger on the evolution of the human healthcare system. Oh, I'm so sorry, I've got some feedback from myself. Um, <laughs> just muting myself there. Um, Sorry, Dr. Kessler's talk will be on the evolution of the human healthcare system as implications for understanding our responses to COVID-19. Dr. Kessler came to evolutionary medicine from a background in animal behavior and primatology. Over the course of her career, she's undertaken several years of field work on primates in Costa Rica, Madagascar, and Govan. After receiving her PhD from Arizona State University, Dr. Kessler moved across a few disciplines, doing a postdoc in disease simulation modeling at McGill in Canada, virology at the Institute of Zoo and Wildlife Research in Germany, and in primate cognition and signaling at Durham University. Over to you, Dr. Kessler. Thank you, Xander. Thank you, Paula, for the invitation. I'm really happy to be here, and I'm happy to, I'm really delighted to talk with everyone about some of the stuff that Bob Unger and I have been thinking about recently. Basically, we're interested in using a cross-species approach to understand how healthcare systems evolve. So if we've learned anything over the past few years, it's that healthcare is important. Um, we've all used it at some point in time. Everyone has been sick or injured or unwell in some way and needed care from someone else, um, whether it be a family member, a friend, or a doctor or nurse. So healthcare is really important and it's basically woven into the fabric of our societies. And healthcare is important not just for the individual who's sick or ill or unwell, but it's also important from a population perspective. And we can think of it as including both public health and including sort of medical care and medicine fields. Um, and so essentially, it's important not just for the individual who, who's sick or unwell, but also for preventing populations from sweeping through, from preventing pathogens from sweeping through populations. So we think of healthcare as something that's associated with being human. And these days, healthcare is extremely, it's basically very technological and we have the biomedical, we, and it's very biomedical. Um, but if we divorce healthcare from medical technologies, then we can think about healthcare behaviors. And if we know that healthcare behaviors seem to, are very important and that healthcare is very important for individuals to survive, then we can start to think about why would it be so, why would something that's so important evolve only in humans? And sure, humans have big brains, but so what? A lot of species have big brains. And it's true, we use our big brains for things like language, culture, and technology. But other species aren't actually all that different in that way. Other species have complex communication systems. They use, they also use their brains for things like social learning and culture, cultural behaviors. They also do complicated tool use. So is it possible that healthcare behaviors might also go further back through evolution than just in humans? And so we can start to think, and so if that might be the case, we can start to think about when. And so here I've made a style, fairly stylized phylogeny. Um, so just to sort of provide a little bit of orientation. Um, so time is on the y-axis, basically going from the bottom forward in time to now. And over on the far side, we see humans. And then the diagram shows, back, shows how our lineage diverged from other groups, sort of going back deeper in time to more distant, more to groups that are more distantly related to us, like other primates, other mammals, other vertebrates, and other animals. So when we look across the animal kingdom, we do see abundant examples of behaviors that look surprisingly like things that we do. Um, for example, we can think of, we can see the giant otters. They have been observed in the wild to provision an older, an older member of a group when she was no longer able to forage herself. Um, 
social insects like bees and ants will do things like they will see they will smear substances and secretions on other individuals that have antifungal and anti and antimicrobial properties. Um, cetaceans, in particular, dolphins. There are numerous examples where they will help individuals that are incapacitated in some way come to the surface to breathe, and they may continue doing this for hours or even days at a time, even sometimes continuing after um, the individual that they're helping has died. And so when we, think of, when we think about these examples, if we don't have some sort of theoretical framework or some way of organizing them, they remain just that. They remain examples or anecdotes without any larger significance. But if we, th if we start to develop an, and create a new evolutionary framework that can help us to organize this data that exists in the scientific literature and to create a foundation for new hypotheses. And so the goals of the talk are gonna be threefold. First, I'm gonna present a, def a new definition of a quote, healthcare system, which can be applied across species. And then I'll use evolutionary theory to organize these examples that we see in the animal literature. And then I'll show how this opens lots of new questions about how healthcare systems evolve over evolutionary time. So first, what is a healthcare system? So in order, to, in order to discuss this, I'm gonna borrow a little bit from the animal behavior fields. So just as social systems are understood to be the result of many small interactions between individuals, we can think of healthcare systems as the emergent effects of individual interactions with conspecifics. So conspecifics are members of the same species with pathogens and with the environment in health-related contexts. So essentially having a concept of a social system allows us to make comparisons about the patterns of social interactions between individuals. So we can look at the patterns within species and the patterns across species. And the same could be, can be done with a, health, a concept of a healthcare system where we're looking at the patterns of interactions between individuals and between individuals and their pathogens, and between the individuals, their pathogens, and the environment. So what we're, what we're essentially talking about are the roots of human health care and public health. But it's important a little bit also to think about what's not included in this definition. For one, it doesn't, it doesn't require medical technology. Um, it doesn't require a concept of what germs are. It doesn't require an understanding of how pathogens are transmitted. It doesn't require a concept of infectiousness. It really probably doesn't even require much intelligence at all. And that in of itself is a little bit interesting. So this concept of a healthcare system, it also articulates with existing immunity-based concepts that are in the literature, but it brings a new focus on explaining the evolution of care. Um, so just to sort of situate it with some of the concepts that are out there. So it's related to the behavioral immune system. The behavioral immune system covers things like individual level responses, focusing on the emotions of disgust and how that helps facilitate avoidance. Basically, when we're disgusted by something, we tend to avoid it. And so that makes us less likely to catch a disease from it. For example, here we might see that there's a cake shown on the screen. Um, we might know that it's a cake, but it's still going to be really difficult to eat that cake because it looks like it has a giant turd on it, even if that might be just frosting. Um, and we can all, there's also another related concept of social immunity, which was developed for understanding the physiological, behavioral, and organizational defenses that um, exist in social insect colonies. And so I'll come back to the defenses of social insects in a few moments later in the talk. So now we've discussed a definition of a healthcare system, which can be applied across species. Basically, that's the healthcare systems can be thought of as patterns of interactions between individuals of a species 
their pathogens in their environment in health-related contexts. And now we're going to use evolutionary theory to organize some of the behaviors and some of the, inter the interactions that we see in the and that we see the, in the literature in a way that will help us to understand it. So if we're using evolutionary theory as the organizing principle, essentially what we're thinking about is who's under selection when an interaction is occurring and how is selection operating? So there are a lot of different ways that selection could be operating. Some of them are things like host pathogen coevolution mutualism, where both, where both parties are benefiting, individual level selection, where selection is acting on a particular individual, kin selection, where individuals are helping genetic relatives, indirect reciprocity, which I'll talk about a little bit more, um, but it's a form of exchange, multi-level selection, where it's occurring at the level of the individual, but then it may also be occurring at the level of a group, um, and niche construction, where individuals and are um, changing their environment. And so before we go further, I'm going to um, go through a few definitions. And essentially, we can think of healthcare, we can sort of organize and unpack the concept of what a healthcare behavior might be in a hierarchical way. So first, we can divide it between care behaviors and community health behaviors. And then within those categories, we can organize it by types of behaviors. So based on who's benefiting and how selection is operating. And I'm gonna go through this in more detail. Um, so these are self-care, kin care, stranger care, environmental protection, and organizational protection. And I'm gonna go through each of, each of these boxes one by one. So first, to talk about the top part of that diagram, we have healthcare behaviors, which can be thought of as behaviors that can control the spread of disease. And they can be divided into care behaviors and community health behaviors based on who on who's they're directed at. So care behaviors can be thought of as directed towards an individual. Um, and this would be an individual that is sick or injured or in need of help in some way. Community health behaviors are behaviors that benefit the group or the community, but they're not necessarily being, but the group or the community isn't necessarily being targeted by the behaviors in the way that care behaviors were. So they, these often operate in a somewhat indirect fashion. So it might be behaviors that are directed towards, um, that are actually enacted upon the environment, which then indirectly benefit the group. And I'll come back to that. So um, now we're going to talk about the be care behaviors side of that diagram. So in general, we have care behaviors. And these are things where one individual does something to another individual or to an individual who is either infected or injured or in need of help in some way. Um, a classic example that we see that's incredibly widespread across animals is, going, is um, social grooming. It's very widespread in mammals, occurs in birds, occurs in insects. Social grooming occurs where individuals remove ectoparasites from each other. Another type of behavior that it frequently involves is provisioning. We talked about the example where it um, with giant otters, where they, they were observed in the wild to be provisioning for an older female who was no longer able to, to hunt on her own and to, to catch fish on her own. Um, it's also been observed in dwarf mongooses, which will huddle and which can provide warmth um, and to provision other sick or unwell individuals in their group as well. And we talked about the example of cetaceans that, were so, that will support individuals that are incapacitated in some way and help them come to the surface to breathe. And this may even continue for hours or days, even long past the individual dies. So how did these behaviors evolve? That's likely to depend on the behavior, who does it, and who's receiving it. And so we're going to use the answers to those questions to sort the behaviors into these, ca these categories 
of self-care, kin care, and stranger care. So self-care benefits the self. It's, like, it's where the individual does something that helps them themselves in some way to either avoid becoming infected or to heal once they are infected. So this could be something like avoiding an individual who's sneezing and clearly infected. Um, it could also be something like cleaning a wound to prevent it from becoming infected. And this is likely to have evolved via natural selection. Individuals that engage in self-care are likely are, in, are benefiting their own health, and this is likely to help them survive so that they can reproduce and pass their genes on into the next generation. Kin care are behaviors that are given to genetic kin, and it's likely to have evolved via kin selection. When one individual helps another to either not become sick or to recover from an infection, they're helping that individual survive. And if they go on and then reproduce, they're passing not only their genes into the next population, the next generation, but also um, a percentage of their genes which they share with, the, with their kin care. There's also stranger care. And this is something that might be uniquely human. Stranger care is care that's given from one individual to another when the two individuals are unrelated and unfamiliar with each other. So most of the care that we receive in a doctor's office or in hospitals would probably qualify as stranger care. We generally don't know the person and don't have any pre-existing other relationship with them. And this is kind of a bizarre behavior when, when we think of it from an evolutionary point of view, because that stranger care is risking their own health and they're risking their own ability to, um, to survive and be healthy in order to help somebody who, if they survive, isn't going to pass on their genes. So you would expect that from an evolutionary perspective, that would be selected against. You would expect that to not be a, something that would survive over a behavior that would survive over evolutionary time, evolutionary times. Yet in our species, it's incredibly widespread and it's very common. And so that sort of raises the question of how did that happen? Why is that there? And it probably evolved through fairly complex selection pressures. And I'm gonna go through a couple potential hypotheses for how they may have happened. And they're not mutually exclusive. It's possible that all could have, all could have occurred. Um, and that it's also not exhaustive, there are others, but these are some of the major possibilities. So for example, it could, have, it could have evolved through direct reciprocity. So direct reciprocity would be something where the carer gets a benefit from the recipient. So for example, a patient gets cared and then they pay for the care. That, allows, that basically allows, this, allows the person who gave the care to receive a direct benefit. Another possibility is indirect reciprocity, which is where the carer gets a benefit, but not from the person they gave the care to. So an example might be if, the, if a patient goes to a hospital and gets care, the patient doesn't pay the doctor, but they might pay the hospital, and the hospital pays the doctor. It could also be a little, it could all, it, but it doesn't have to be to do with money. It could also be based on reputation. It could be that the carer provides care to somebody and they don't necessarily get paid, but they might be known to be a good person and this might increase their social status and make it so that more likely, so that later other people are more likely to help them if they ever need help. Another possibility is multi-level selection. Groups with care might be out-competing groups that don't provide care. And this would be particularly likely if caregiving is able to control the spread of diseases through the population so that groups that are providing care experience less, have less, less of a disease burden on the members of their population. So how did we go from simple exchanges between pairs of individuals to the complex global health system that we have today? It was probably a fairly long process, 
but it probably involved some form of professionalization and in increasing specialization of stranger care. And as we developed, as institutions formed, stranger care probably started to be dispensed through institutions, similar to how a lot of our public services are today. Um, and in recent times, we also saw an increasing amount of te technological complexity. So just now I've skipped over a bunch of the literature that involves the fossil record. Um, there's, a, there's literature and debate in the fossil record about to what extent we see evidence of care or not in various fossil hominins. And we can come back to that and discuss it during the questions if, um, if folks want to. But for now, I'll, move, I'll sort of move on. Um, so essentially, the place that we are, the situation we're in now, sort of where we are now, is that we see that the, some of the major ways that care is given today is very different from the ways that it probably, from the situation in which it probably evolved. Basically, it probably evolved being given between people who knew each other fairly well, like potentially kin cares, and now we have a global, a, a global health industry. So that's quite different and quite new in the scale of human evolution. So that brings up questions of evolutionary mismatches evolutionary mismatches occur when the evolved response to a problem no longer matches the current context. An example of how this might be occurring for us today is the placebo effect. Um, symptoms for like disease symptoms can be thought of as more than just effects of the activation of the immune system. Symptoms can also be used as signal and recognized as signals as a need for care. For example, when we're, when we're sick or infected, our color might change. When we have a fever, we might get rashes that show up as funny spots. Um, our voice might change. We might start coughing. We, our behavior might change. We might become grumpy and lethargic. Um, so when these, and these effects can be used as signals um, to signal that an individual is in need of care. So today, in the context in which our care in which caregiving evolved, it was probably among between individuals who knew each other quite well. And so signaling a need for care was probably very important in making sure that you got it. Um, and the signaling doesn't have to be conscious, um, though it, some of the behavioral signals can be conscious. Um, but today, so much of the diagnostics that occur are very technologically and are very technological and they're based on objective criteria that is not dependent on the relationship between the care and the patient. And so when symptoms abate because the patient realizes that they're going to get care, it looks rather strange because that signaling function is no longer needed in today's world. Another interesting phenomenon that happened that may be happening in our lineage are displacements. And this is when an ancestral form of care is given through a newer, more uh, newer derived, more recently evolved form, causing the two forms of care to conflict and to work against each other. An example of this might be that um, through evolutionary times, the care for older people was probably done primarily through kin networks. Um, today, kin care for older people is basically being displaced by stranger care in that a lot of care for older people is done in care homes or it's done when professional care has come to people's houses. And this can lead to conflicts and mistrust when um, kin carers and family don't necessarily trust the stranger carers and vice versa. And so now I'm going to move to talking about the community health behaviors. So community health behaviors are behaviors that benefit the group or the community, but they're not but individual individuals are not necessarily the target of the behaviors. So an example of this in animals would be, for example, nest sanitation in birds, or removing, for example, removing fecal sacs from nests to keep the nest clean to reduce transmission to the nestlings. Um, an example in humans would be disinfecting public spaces to reduce COVID-19 transmission. 
And one of the one of the types of um, behaviors that that exists that's a part of uh, or one of the types of um, community health behaviors is environmental protection. And these types of things, it's sanitation and cleaning. And then this occurs through niche construction. Organisms modify their environment such that future generations inherit that modified environment, which can then impact the selection pressures faced by that species. Uh, an example of that would be, um, would be termites. So if termites are building nests in ways that reduce the, reduce the ability of pathogens to grow, then they, they will have experience less selection pressure based on those pathogens. Those pathogens will exert less selection on them. Um, that will be the case for both for that generation and the generations that are born into that nest. Um, examples of that also occur in humans in that we engage in a lot of cleaning behaviors in our homes and in our communities. A second form of community health behavior is organizational protection. And this occurs with divisions when um, groups engage in divisions of labor and synchronizing behaviors across space or time. So for example, one behavior that both social insects often engage in and humans engage in is we have subgroups of individuals that deal with disposing of waste and disposing of the, this is my cat, um, that deal with disposing of waste and deal with um, disposing of the dead. And this, be, if you have a subgroup of individuals who do, who do that, and it's a fairly risky behavior in the, those individuals are potentially being exposed to pathogens. Um, those risks are basically sequestered within that group of individuals and only those who come in contact with them rather than the whole group. Um, another example would be synchronizing behaviors across space or time. And this is something that humans do, for example, social, um, like community-wide social distancing during a pandemic or mass administration of drug programs. So in social insects, these behaviors probably, um, probably arose through kin selection because of the way that the, nest the nests are structured with a queen and, non and then non-reproductive groups and um, the social insects are often very related to each other. In humans, it probably evolved via, via multi-level selection in the groups that are engaging in this type of behavior are more likely to be able to control the spread of pathogens through them. And, and then the individuals living in those groups are gonna be better able to reproduce. So just to review where we've been, um, we've discussed self-care, kin care, and stranger care, and environmental protection and organizational protection. So now if we're coming back to um, how these categories, so now if we're coming back to the, phy the phylogeny that I had before, we can start to think about how these categories of healthcare behaviors are distributed across species. And that can help us reconstruct a little bit about when they might have evolved. Um, with the caveat that if we don't see a behavior in a species it, or a, a group, it doesn't necessarily mean it's not there research effort has been very unevenly distributed across species. So the picture may change as we develop, as we get more information. But to, to go from sort of, to start with what we know so far. So if we look at self-care, it's probably widespread and likely to be ancestral. Um, just about all animals have ways of avoid, trying to avoid pathogens, and when they are infected, to trying to take care of themselves. So this can probably be thought, this probably evolved very early um, in animals, and it's, which means that it's ancestral, and it is widespread. So kin care likely evolved together with kin-based sociality. Once kin were living in social groups, then they're 
then they are available to each other to be helped and to help each other when um, some when one of them is ill. Um, so we know that kin that social that kin based sociality has evolved multiple times from less social ancestors. Um, kin based sociality has evolved in mammals. It's evolved in other vertebrates like birds. It's also evolved in invertebrates. And so that that brings the possibility that kin if kin care evolved when kin based sociality and living in kin groups evolved that kin care may have evolved multiple times and the blue arrows here are not specific evolutionary events but they're just sort of showing how this may have occurred where we may see multiple cases where it evolved multiple times stranger care seems like it might be unique to humans if that's the case then it would have evolved since humans split off from other um, from other primates. Environmental protection is probably also likely to be widespread and ancestral. Just about all animals modify their environment in some way, and if they do so in a way that uh, that makes it less likely that they'll catch that they will become infected with pathogens then environmental protection is likely to be widespread and ancestral as well. Organizational protection, which is um, subgrouping among individuals to reduce the transmission of pathogens or um, sort of patterning of behaviors in space or time to reduce the spread of pathogens. Um, those behaviors seem like they have probably evolved separately in humans and multiple lineages of social insects. So when we think back about the, these, um, how these behavior, different behaviors are patterned on the, on the, and distributed across species, what's the big picture that we see? Well, for me, the big picture that we see is that the different types of healthcare behaviors, that is self-care, kin care, stranger care, um, environmental and organizational, organizational protection, show different patterns of evolution producing different combinations of behaviors in different lineages. So just to quickly review where we've been, um, we've, just we've just started organizing the, some of the examples and the data within the literature into self-care, kin care, stranger care, envi environmental and organizational protection. And now we're going to move to looking about at how this can be this framework can be used to open new questions um, about how healthcare systems evolve over evolutionary time. So for me, this distribution of sort of the this mosaic pattern of how the healthcare behaviors are distributed across species brings up some questions. The first one is what produces this mosaic pattern? And the second one is, do the different categories of behaviors interact? For example, if one type of healthcare behavior evolves in a lineage, does that make it more or less likely that other ones will? So for example, one possibility, one question that we can think of is, did kin care evolve from kin-based infant rearing systems? So we know when we look across species that there's great variation in how in kin-based infant rearing systems. It can vary from a lot of care given a ver to no care given. Um, when care is given to, to young, it can be basically primarily maternal based. It could be biparental care. It could also involve a lot of allo care from, um, from group mates. So we can use what we know about that to develop predictions. For example, across species, we might expect that kin care should co-occur with kin-based infant rearing as opposed to no care. So we would not expect to see kin care in species where you don't get infant care. 
kin care should be greater in species with greater kin-based infant care, for example, cooperative breeding with substantial amounts of aloe care versus single parent rearing versus no parental care. And across species, we might expect that the specific care behaviors should differ, but be those that each species uses for infant care. And we do seem to see a bit of this um, when we look across when we look across species. For example, it seems like species that engage in cooperative provisioning of young are also species that are more likely to extend that behavior to um, adults when they are when they are injured or ill. They're more likely to be provisioned as well. And what this does is sort of what some of these questions and predictions allow us to start thinking about are questions like, could kin care be a co an extension or a co-optation or a byproduct even of infant based of kin based infant rearing systems? Essentially, did the behaviors that are given to kin and are given to um, young are parental behaviors basically extended to others when they're also in need due to being ill or injured? Another question that we can ask is about um, how niche construction may in, um, produce environmental protection activities. For example, does greater niche construction activities co-occur with greater environmental protection activities? So there's a, there's a great variation across animals in how much niche construction they engage in. Um, in particular, some niches involving uh, with species that are dependent upon building nests to live in or burrowing, engage, engage in quite a lot of niche construction, and they might be expected to engage in more environmental protection activities. Essentially, if you're building a structure to live in, it probably makes sense to do so in a way where you will have less pathogens in that structure that you're living in rather than more. So we can turn that into protection predictions, we can say environmental protection behaviors should be greater in species with greater dependence on niche construction behaviors, for example, nesting or burrowing. And across species, we might expect that the specific behaviors, the specific types of construction, niche construction behaviors should differ, but those that each species uses for niche construction will also be some of the behaviors that they use for environmental protection. So now we come to the second question that we talked about, which was how do the categories of behaviors interact? So each behavior category, kin care, stranger care, self-care, environmental protection, and organizational protection will probably have different effects on the contact structures of the population and thus how pathogens move through it. And what I mean by the contact structure is basically how frequently and in which individuals come into contact with, in, with infectious individuals. So basically the interactions between susceptible individuals and infectious individuals. So specifically, we can, we can expect that kin care would probably increase transmission within kin groups because the care needs to come in contact with the person that they're caring for most of the time. Um, stranger care should increase transmission between kin groups. And this is this different, um, this, this is useful for thinking about um, how sort of how the diseases will move between aspects of the, between subgroups within the population. Um, Self-care should decrease transmission between individuals because the individual is either avoiding becoming infected or they're doing things to promote their own recovery and reduce the amount of time that they're infectious. Environmental protection should decrease transmission via the environment. So this would be, include things like soil transmitted parasites, parasi um, pathogens on surfaces of things, etc. cetera. Um, and organizational protection is going to decrease 
transmission between individuals because it's going to increase subgrouping and it's going to increase the structure within the population. So not all individuals are going to come in contact with all other individuals. And so that reduces the number that reduces the number of interactions where there's the possibility for exposures and disease spread. And so we can start thinking about, are there feedback loops between care and protection behaviors? So here I have kin care and stranger care shown in red because those are expected to increase, um, increase contact between susceptible individuals and infected individuals. And I have self-care, environmental protection and organizational protection in green because those likely to decrease transmission. And so we can think about how they might interact and we can make predictions. We might say across species, species with higher frequencies of kin care, because stranger care is, seems to be um, exclusive to us, will also be likely to have higher levels of self-care or environmental or organizational protection. Essentially, if you have high levels of care, which is increasing the exposures and the possibility of transmission, you might also need other mechanisms to help control the spread of pathogens through the population. And this would probably be important for preventing the population from being wiped out. And there may be effects with population density in this. For example, when we look at um, so species taxa that have high levels of environmental and organizational protection behaviors are in particular social insects um, and humans. And, that, and we're also species that live at high densities and engage in high levels of care. And so then we, it might be that then you're, we're seeing other mechanisms coming through to help control the effects of that. And the last question that I wanted to, um, that I wanted to pose for folks to think about is about the effects on the immune system. And we can think about whether or not we might expect caregiving to have effects on how the immune system has been subject to selection. So if caregiving increases exposures between susceptible individuals and um, infected individuals, you might expect that that's going to cause, that's going to exert selection on the immune system. And the immune system is going to need to, is going to be, have been selected to basically withstand that. And one possibility is that that may have exerted selection um, for increased investment in acquired immunity. And the immune system can be sort of divided, in, parts of aspects of the immune system can be divided into different um, sort of different um, categories. And acquired immune responses are ones where an individual is exposed to a pathogen, uh, may be infected with a pathogen and recovers and then has developed specific defenses for recognizing and then clearing that pathogen in subsequent exposures. And so that gives the individual a level of immunity. Um, if, that is, if, that is the, if that happens, that individual is, is probably fairly well placed to provide care in the future, perhaps when that individual's own offspring are exposed and ill with that, in, with that pathogen in the future. And so, um, some of the work that one of my current master's students, Bethany Gilbert, has been working on is she's been running some um, agent-based models looking at how pathogens circulating through a population might or might not select for increased investment in acquired immunity. And that paper has been sub submitted to EMPH and will hopefully um, at some point be be come out in publication. And so now I'm sort of reaching the end of the talk. So I just wanted to go through to, to go talk, review some of the take home messages. So the first is that we've discussed a new definition of a healthcare system, which can be applied across species. Um, and we're looking, it focuses on how we can think about patterns of interactions between individuals and between with their pathogens and with the environment. And we used evolutionary theory to organize examples of non-human caregiving into um, self-care, kin care, stranger care, environmental and organizational protection. And we've opened some new questions about how healthcare systems may evolve over evolutionary time. 
thank you all for listening. And I'd be happy to discuss any questions that you might have. Uh, Sarah, I was muted for a second. Thank you, Dr. Kessler, for a great talk. Um, we have lots of questions coming in from the chat. Um, we have a few anonymous ones to start with, such as this one. Um, how do healthcare behaviors apply to diseases which don't really spread, such as non-communicable diseases or allergies? Um, so we that's actually a great question. It's one that I get fairly frequently. So I would say that, um, so if we're thinking about that over evolutionary time, I would say that actually non-infectious diseases or injuries, basically things that can't be spread, would have helped the evolution of caregiving evolve because it reduces the costs. Most individuals, and a lot of times until, uh, until we have a scientific understanding of a condition, we don't know if it's, going to be, if it's going to spread or not. And so through most of our evolutionary times, um, we wouldn't have known that either. And so every time you're helping somebody, you're potentially taking a chance and if some of those conditions are non-infectious, um, in those cases, basically, you don't have to pay the cost of potentially getting infected yourself. Okay, great answer. Thank you. Um, next, we have a question from Elodie, who is wondering which category you would put care from one individual to another, uh, for example, group members who are not genetically related, but aren't strangers. So that's kind of an in-between case. We see a lot of that in humans. Um, it's hard to say whether or not we would, it, I've kind of thought a lot about it. It's hard to say whether or not I would, we would put that into um, kin care behaviors being given to individuals who are non-kin. Um, it probably, uh, that behavior, those behaviors probably evolved through various forms of reciprocity. In the, because you see, because they're people that you know and they're friends, if you help them, you know that they're likely to help you in the future when you need it. Oh, and Elodie has another question. Um, mm -hmm. How would you interpret interspecific care, like the many examples of interspecies grooming? Um, so in, in, it probably varies, um, but quite often there are examples of mutualism, where one species gets a benefit and the other one also gets a benefit, though they might be different benefits. And we have one more question from Elodie. Um, <laughs> do you think that humans have lost the ability to detect certain sicknesses in others? Some macaques can smell parasitic infections in others. Do you think this is something that we lost or something that they gained? Um, so I don't think it's something, I don't think it's necessarily something that we lost. Um, different species sort of have different, um, have different senses. And so they detect things differently. Um, we, um, our senses aren't necessarily, our, um, our sense of smell isn't as acute as many species. And so whether that's been lost, I guess, on a larger scale, potentially that's been lost, but I wouldn't say the ability to, I wouldn't say we've lost the ability to detect a specific sickness that we used to detect in that sense. Um, though we know that basically over sort of the evolutionary time, for example, humans and other apes tend to have less, um, we have less, we have less acute sense of smell. Mm -hmm. Great. Thank you. Um, we also have a question from Gabriella mm -hmm. who asks, what leads an animal to decide not to give care or remove care completely? For example, two eagle chicks, uh, only one eventually survives as the parents stop feeding the other or the sibling bullies it. Um, so this is on an, so it's, in some ways it seems quite cruel. Um, evolution often is cruel. Um, if you have, basically you have two eagle chicks and eventually only one survives, my guess would be that over evolutionary time, if it's not possible for both of them to survive, essentially the parents invest in the one that's most likely to survive because if the, and if that works and they're over evolutionary time and one individual is likely to survive, the 
the parents' genes continue in the population versus parents who um, tried to feed both and neither survived. Mm -hmm. would, would you expect there then to be um, a, a cure or a signal for uh, more likely to survive, basically, from the chicks? Uh, and if that was the case, wouldn't there also be a kind of pressure for a mimic of that cure as well? Yeah, I guess I probably, I probably would expect that whether it be sort of the energy of begging and whoever is most successful in begging um, or in more, more successful in getting the attention of the parents potentially. Mm -hmm. Okay, great. We have a few uh, anonymous questions coming through still. Yeah. Um, what kind of evidence is sufficient to show healthcare and fossils? Um, so, that, so basically there's been a lot of debate. Um, I would say I'm not entirely sure. Um, for quite a long time, there, like there's been evidence of um, healed injuries or healed infections where, where you can see from the fossils that healing occurred. And so you, you can tell that the individual didn't, um, didn't die at least immediately from whatever occurred to them which has at times been argued, okay, so that's probably, that's going to be evidence that they probably received care because they wouldn't have survived without it. But then when we look at um, the things that happen among animals, we can see that they actually often survive very similar and absolutely horrific things. Like you, for example, you have primates that will survive wounds from snares where they actually wind up with like hands or feet or, you know, fingers winding up severed. And that's got to be completely horrible. Um, but often they do wind up surviving. They often do wind up surviving some of that um, with what we would consider to be very little amounts of care. That said, some of what some of the behaviors that are that get given, um, you know, things like just waiting for an individual if they're having trouble if they're having trouble keeping up with the group can be beneficial to the individual that's struggling because that just having another individual around reduces their risk of predation. But those behaviors don't fossilize. So it's very difficult to know if they occurred. So kind of what we wind up, what you wind up saying is we can't be sure that care was given, but it is possible. Um, I know that there has been a fairly recent publication where there's been an argument that about 30,000 years ago of a potential uh, possible deliberate um, surgery being used. And they would have looked basically at the way, um, they looked at um, sort of the patterns of cut marks and concluded that it looked like a surgery. Um, but that's significantly more recent than um, that that's in significantly more recent times in an evolutionary scale. Okay, great. We have one more question that I can see so far uh, mm -hmm. coming from the chat is, uh, please can you tell us more about the ABM study? Um, okay, so essentially what we were, um, what Bethany was looking at is she was trying to see, she was looking at the costs of using different aspects of the immune system. So if you're, so innate responses to the immune system tend to be more costly to use and to deploy, but less costly to basically develop. Um, whereas acquired immune responses are more costly to develop. The individual has to survive um, the infection and they all, and have to develop the specific responses for recognizing and dealing with that pathogen. But once that is the case, um, once that is the case, then there, then acquired immune responses are much cheaper to use. And so she basically use, you can use a computer program to create a hypothetical population of individuals that then basically can be programmed to move and interact according to the rules that you give it. And you can then infect your hypothetical population. Um, and she looked at the effects of different um, pathogens moving through the population and, and under different conditions, so under conditions of caregiving, conditions without caregiving, and looked at and varied the rules for how they invest in immune evolving immune dis, 
uh, invest in sort of acquired versus innate immunity. Um, and then look and let it run over generations and look to see which um, strategies came out over time. Um, and it looked like under certain circumstances, um, caregiving does is actually selecting able to select for um, acquired immune responses. Great, thank you. Um, I don't think we have any more questions. Um, so I think from all of us here who uh, have organized the seminar series, we want to say thank you very much for coming. We hope that everyone in the audience has enjoyed. I'm sure they will have. Uh, and we hope to see people at our next seminar coming very soon. Thank you. Thank you for coming. Thank you for having me. <laughs>